Alrighty. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening. All right, looks like we're going. We'll unmute. Good. All right, so good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. I'm bringing both of the streams on together, and Facebook should be live here in a second. It looks like we're live on Facebook now. Okay, so again, Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. What we do at Gates Brain Health is referred to as functional neurology. And so we do see Parkinson's patients, and lots of times they have questions about their disease and how it came about, and hopefully I will be able to answer some of those questions tonight and maybe open up some thoughts on natural treatments. A lot of the discussion in the literature is connecting the gut and the brain axis or axes together. And so let me know what you think, send me your comments, and we'll go from there. Okay, so this picture is from the book Principles of Neural Science. I think this is from the fifth edition in the basal ganglia chapter. And I just like to present this here because most of you with Parkinson's, and let me grab my chapstick again, it's recently been cold here in Nevada. <clears throat> um, most of you with Parkinson's, or if you know someone with Parkinson's, you understand it's a disorder of dopamine. And the title of tonight's broadcast is Beyond the Dopamine. And so hopefully you'll get a better understanding of your brain and really what's happening from a neuropathological standpoint to result in a dopamine deficiency and therefore the treatments that are being employed by your neurologist or if you're talking about doing deep brain surgery. So without further ado, these deep structures in the brain are referred to collectively as the basal ganglia. They can be considered a cluster of nuclei that are heavily important in the control of movement. So here you see the caudate nucleus. Down here you see the putamen. The caudate and the putamen are collectively referred to as the striatum. Down here you have the globus pallidus, also referred to as the pallidum. It has an external and an internal segment. Down here we have the subthalamic nucleus of Louise, sometimes referred to just as the subthalamic nucleus because in neurology they're trying to get away from using people's names, I believe referred to as eponyms. And then down here you have the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra is part of your midbrain, it's at the top of your brainstem. And this part is referred to as the pars compacta because it's a very dense collection of dopamine producing neurons. So this substantia nigra is where you make dopamine from for the importance of movement. There are other areas of your brain that make dopamine too, like the nucleus accumbens. It also produces a lot of dopamine for what we refer to as the basal forebrain and your frontal lobes and areas like that. So basically you have the putamen, which is really important in movement. You have the pallidum, which is very important in movement. You have the subthalamic nucleus. This is your thalamus, so the thalamus is very important in movement. And again, this is what you would consider a frontal section of the brain and what it looks like. And for those of you on Facebook, you can go back and look at the YouTube Live where I have the PowerPoint screen and screen presentation. So next we're moving on to a diagram of what are referred to as the direct and indirect and hyperdirect pathways of the basal ganglia. So just think with your car, with your car you have a gas pedal and you have a brake pedal. And it's important to have both because one without the other leads to bad consequences or you not be able to get where you want to go. So the direct pathway basically was initially thought to facilitate movements, whereas the indirect pathway was thought to facilitate inhibition of movements. So here you can see in the diagram, and I'm going through this, some of this neurophysiology just because I think it's important that all Parkinson's patients and loved ones of Parkinson's patients grab onto this and understand it. So if you want to move, 
your motor cortex, which is going to be up through here, and for those of you on Facebook, it's going to be through here, has to have some notion that it wants to move a body part. So if I want to move my left arm, for example, then out here in the motor cortex, we are going to have some cells that are probably going to create some sort of command signal. Now that command signal really has to go through the basal ganglia before it goes anywhere. And depending on what literature you look at, I've, I've read some studies where they say you can have 20 command signals go through your frontal lobes and down to the basal ganglia, like 20 of them, before your arm even moves. So this is a beautiful computer, so to speak. And so your frontal lobe talks down through the putamen. The putamen is going to talk to this internal segment of the globus pallidus, which then talks to the thalamus, which then sends a signal back up to the cortex. Now, the black arrows indicate inhibitory pathways. Red indicates uh, excitatory pathways. But basically, two negatives equal positive. If you remember back to grade school and high school, two negatives equal positive. So here we have excitation of the putamen. Then we have inhibition of the globus pallidus pars interna, inhibition of the thalamus, which leads to excitation of the cortex. So that's referred to as the direct. The indirect involves a longer pathway down through the external segment of the globus pallidus, down to the subthalamic nucleus of Louise, which results in an excitatory signal, to the internal segment of the globus pallidus, which then sends an inhibitory signal to the thalamus. So that is thought to basically result in more inhibition, the indirect pathway. And then you can see here the hyperdirect pathway just basically circumvents everything and talks to the subthalamic nucleus of Louise. Again, for those of you on Facebook, you probably really want to watch this on YouTube so you can see the screen in the screen. And then this is just a diagram, again, from Principles of Neuroscience, um, demonstrating that there are other areas of the basal ganglia. So there are many loops, so to speak. And so we have a motor loop, we have an eye movement loop, there's an executive or associative loop, and there's also an emotional, oftentimes referred to as a limbic loop, of the basal ganglia. So, so many elements of our brain function are kept in balance and modulated by the basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia is hugely important. And then here I attached a diagram of what's referred to as a DAT scan. Uh, for those of you with Parkinson's, you probably have some familiarity with DAT scans. DAT scans are basically used to look at dopamine in the brain, but they don't per se diagnose Parkinson's. They are more used to differentiate Parkinson's disease from a central tremor. Why is that? Well, Parkinson's is still, at this point in time, a clinical diagnosis. What are the clinical features of Parkinson's disease? Typically, a person will present with what? A tremor. Most of you have some notion that if somebody has a tremor, they might have Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease patients tend to have a tremor at rest. So it's somebody sitting there watching TV and you see their hand tremoring up and down. It might be Parkinson's. Other features of Parkinson's include a slowing of movement. And so you may notice this as someone trying to turn around and it looks as though their feet are stuck on, onto the ground. Or, you know, they may be trying to reach into the fridge and they just can't move their arm. It may be a loved one trying to get out of the bathtub and they're unable to get out of the bathtub. And then there may be rigidity where they're just, they're generally stiff and you try to move them around and they're just, they're stiff as a board. Uh, and so those are the characteristic features. Also postural instability is a feature. But now basically the clinical diagnosis yields that a person probably needs to have two out of those three to have Parkinson's. So they may have tremor, they may have rigidity, they may have slowing of movement. So neurologists do these tests where we have people close their hands and we do tests like this. And we're trying to see how quickly and fluidly they can move. And if there's a slowing of that movement, it's called bradykinesia. So that is how Parkinson's disease is diagnosed at this point in time. But the problem is, is that essential tremor can manifest as someone basically having a tremor at rest and they may have, you know, some problems moving. So that's where neurologists may order a DAT scan. And as you can see here on the screen, what they're showing is decreased dopamine uptake in the putamen and the basal ganglia. And so if we see decreased dopamine uptake in a person with tremor, it probably means that they don't have essential tremor. And then here, I just put up a quick diagram of how dopamine is produced. 
Uh, this is from Champs Biochemistry, uh, page 284, for those who want that. It's a great biochemistry book, if I say so myself. Uh, no royalties is associated with that. I just think it's a really nice biochemistry book. And they show the conversion of tyrosine. Tyrosine is an amino acid. And how tyrosine is converted into 3,4-dihydroxyphenylalanine, which is dopamine. That's L-DOPA. And so those of you who have Parkinson's, what do you take? Levodopa, carbidopa. So levodopa refers to this L-DOPA. And L-DOPA is seen in naturally occurring plants. So that's something I may talk about later. But basically, levodopa is then converted by dopa decarboxylase into dopamine. And so the thought is that if you bolster levodopa, dopa decarboxylase will form dopamine. Keep in mind that dopamine also gets converted into norepinephrine and epinephrine. And as I diagram down here on the bottom picture, you can see that dopamine is broken down by methyltransferase and monoamine oxidase enzymes. You probably have heard of MAO inhibitors if you've watched pharmaceutical commercials regarding antidepressants. So that's Parkinson's. From the clinical feature standpoint, we know how a Parkinson's disease patient presents. We know that there's a lack of dopamine. We know that Parkinson's patients are typically put on a first-line treatment approach, approach of levodopa, carpidopa. There are extended release forms of that. It's not my job to talk about the pharmaceuticals tonight. I'm talking about things beyond dopamine. And that segues into this next portion of the discussion. Here, this is an article from 2003. You, you all know that I typically try to bring you the newest articles, but I'm taking you back to 2003 when a seminal article came out in the neurobiology of aging, basically, where they this, this author, Brock, came up with a staging criteria related to Parkinson's disease. And with Parkinson's disease in the brain, and let me go back up to that first diagram, the substantia nigra, they knew that the substantia nigra of Parkinson's patients, there was not the adequate amount of dopamine being produced. So there's a paucity of dopamine and they were losing cells. And from a neuropathology standpoint, they saw in the substantia nigra, these accumulations of things called Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites. And so there was a neuropathological lesion causing Parkinson's. So that these Lewy bodies resulted in lack of dopamine production. What we've since realized is that these Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites are throughout the nervous system. And Brock proposed in 2003 that this was not haphazard, that there was actually kind of a, a trajectory, so to speak. There was this, this way that the Lewy bodies and the, the proteins within the Lewy bodies, referred to as alpha synuclein, were spreading, almost like a timeline. And so basically, Dr. Brock found, and I believe his wife was included in the study, found that the Parkinson's process started in the gut. I missed all my stammering. Basically, Parkinson's disease, they found, was starting in the gut. You have nerve plexes throughout your body. So if you watch my other videos, you'll know that. If you haven't watched them, then we'll we'll go over it in general detail. You know that you have a spinal cord. You know that you have peripheral nerves. You know that you may have an autonomic nervous system, which in part runs through those peripheral nerves, but in part you have this thing called the sympathetic nervous system, and then you have uh, also the parasympathetic nervous system, which may not run in peripheral nerves. So basically you have this autonomic nervous system going on all the time to many different organs of your body. You have nerves in your skin. You have nerves in your gut called the enteric plexus or enteric nervous system. Enteric refers to the gastrointestinal tract. And so Dr. Brock noticed that this alpha synuclein, now alpha synuclein is a normal protein in our body, but basically it gets misfolded into what are referred to as beta sheets. And this misfolding of the alpha synuclein becomes the alpha synucleinopathy that you may hear people talk about, alpha synucleinopathy. There are three major forms of alpha synucleinopathies, including Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, and also multi-system atrophy. And so 
those are the alpha synucleinopathies. And what Brock found, again, is that this alpha synuclein accumulation started in the gut years before it ever spread to the brain. He started seeing alpha synuclein accumulation in the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve. So everybody's talking about the vagus nerve now and how you stimulate the vagus nerve and get into a parasympathetic state. Well, basically, he found in the control nucleus of the vagus nerve this accumulation of alpha synuclein. And he was seeing it in the olfactory bulb where we smell things. And so this raised the question of what is happening. And if you talk to Parkinson's patients, you'll oftentimes find years before the onset of illness, what two features? Constipation, lack of smell. And so this was correlating with that clinical observation that neurologists have been seeing for a really, really long time. And so it's thought that this Parkinson's process didn't just haphazardly, per se, start in the brain. I'll talk about that later. Um, but it started elsewhere. And it raises the question that Parkinson's disease is a multi-organ phenomenon, meaning we're seeing this neuropathological lesion in the enteric nervous system, in your GI tract, your stomach, your intestines, your colon, the nervous system there. We're seeing this neuropathological lesion in the skin. They're now actually starting to think of using skin punch biopsies to tell if someone is going to develop Parkinson's. They're now seeing basically changes in cardiac function because you have nerves going from your brain stem down to your heart and changes in cardiac function as being a predictor of who will develop Parkinson's. So that may open up Pandora's box and hopefully that opens up some thoughts for all of you when it comes to this. And here are just some diagrams of the dorsal motor nucleus and you can see these different stages that Dr. Brock was talking about. You can see basically stage six looks different than stage one. So we see this accumulation of these alpha synuclein um, particles. That's basically what this is representing. Um, I believe some of these arrows are pointing to Lewy bodies and Lewy bo and Lewy neurites. So that is what is going on. So let me see here. And then this diagram is kind of the one that everybody looks at, and this was the initial proposal for how the Parkinson's disease is is progressing. You can see how Dr. Brock was showing that the alpha synucleinopathy spreads up the brainstem to ultimately involve the substantia nigra, which is at the top of the brainstem in the midbrain, just general brain anatomy, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, or medulla as most people say. Um, so he saw the progression up the brainstem. And then there are other patterns throughout the brain that you can see here with the direction of the arrows that the alpha synucleinopathy eventually spread. Hence, Brock's staging criteria. Now, this is, a, this is a really, really interesting topic. And this is out of the International Journal of Molecular Sciences, where the title of the article is, What is the Evidence that Parkinson's Disease is a Prion Disorder? which originates in the gut. So you probably have heard of prion disorders like mad cow disease, creutzfeldt jakob disease. Prion disorders were discovered, I believe, at the University of Cal California, San Francisco School of Medicine by a guy named Stanley something. I can't remember his last name, but basically he discovered these prion disorders. And you see prion disorders in, uh, I believe, pop uh, certain areas of the world where maybe there is some uh, cannibalism going on and basically eating brain tissue can result in the transmission of these prions. Also, when we had the mad cow epidemic, prions were basically being passed from neurological tissue of cows to then humans. And then there's creutzfeldt jakob disease. You can look that up. And in essence, with prions, you have this proteinaceous infectious agent that can wreak havoc on the neurological system, your brain and your spinal cord. And so here what they are showing, and I'll read this to you, prion stands for protein proteinaceous infectious particle, which can self-transform its shape and propagate and thus can be transmitted from cell to cell. 
So basically it's a protein that can change its shape and be transformed and then propagated, meaning transfer itself from cell to cell by some mechanism between individuals and even different species. So that's another really interesting thing, you know, mad cows going from a cow to a human. Now they're worried about, um, you know, for the deer hunters that there can be these uh, spongy form encephalopathies that are being transmitted from the deer population to humans. So they said a starting point of hypothesis came from the independent post-mortem, meaning people who are dead, observations that embryonic mesencephalic, meaning midbrain, I showed you the midbrain, top part of the brainstem, healthy neurons grafted into the brains of Parkinson's disease patients acquired Lewy bodies several years after the transplantation. What does that mean? It means that they took healthy mesencephalic neurons from an embryo. So they took from an embryo the neurons of the midbrain, they put them into the midbrain of a deceased Parkinson's patient, and basically the Parkinson's neuropathological process, Lewy bodies with alpha synuclein, then started taking over these healthy embryonic brain cells. Um, so that was rather striking. So somehow the alpha synucleinopathy is spreading from the deceased cells into these healthy cells. So that's pretty unnerving. And he said results from experiments on animals have suggested that alpha synuclein can spread from the enteric nervous system to the brain by the vagus nerve. The hypothesis is supported by data about the decreased risk of developing Parkinson's disease in patients who underwent a full truncal vagotomy. So if they cut the vagus nerve, then the chance of developing Parkinson's is dramatically reduced. Again, showing that Parkinson's is starting in the gut for what we're finding is a lot of individuals, not everyone, but a lot of individuals. And if you look at this diagram here, the number of publications in PubMed on the gut brain axis, and Parkinson's disease and prion-like disease and Parkinson's disease, you can see that since 2010 to 2017, a lot of articles are being published on this, and this is a lot of the discussion and the literature on this topic. They go on to say, of note, the increased alpha-synuclein immunoreactivity has also been demonstrated in intestinal biopsies collected from clinically healthy individuals who later experienced an onset of Parkinson's disease. So we're finding that alpha-synuclein, they're seeing it in the intestines, not just the theory that, you know, alpha-synuclein causes constipation. That's why Parkinson's disease patients have constipation 30 years before. They see this accumulation of this abnormal protein in the gut of people who later develop Parkinson's. And it's reasonable, they say it is, it is reasonable to speculate that alpha-synuclein pathology is present before CNS neurodegeneration as an overexpression of alpha-synuclein correlates positively with the prevalence of its aggregations in both the intestines and the brains. In line with this, alpha-synuclein inclusions have been almost consistently shown to occur in the GI tract of Parkinson's disease patients in all stages of the disorder. Phosphorylated and aggregated alpha-synuclein has been detected in the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, colon, and rectum of Parkinson's disease patients. So again, it's not just a disease of the brain. This alpha-synuclein they have found pretty much from stem to stern, so to speak. So from the esophagus to the stomach to the small intestines to the colon to the rectum, a Parkinson's disease patient. So that raises a question, is Parkinson's disease really a gastrointestinal disease, starts as a gastrointestinal disease that spreads to the brain? And one of Brock's theories was that it was an infectious agent that somehow came into the body, either through the mouth or through the nose. It then set into motion the alpha synucleinopathy, and then that led to spreading to other areas of the body. Here is an article um, from Nature where they basically said ingestion of sub-threshold doses of environmental toxins induces ascending Parkinsonism in the rat which is pretty wild. So they gave these rats toxins, and basically then these rats developed Parkinson's disease, and I believe they were genetically susceptible um, 
Parkinson's disease rats. And that raises another question. So a lot of you are going to say, well, is Parkinson's genetic? Well, there can be genetic forms of it, but they're not really as common. Some estimates, I think, said around 3 or 5% of all Parkinson's disease patients have a genetic, a strong genetic component. Um, if you want to look at genetics, I think it's LRRK2 PARC genes. There, there's many different types of PARC, P-A-R-K genes, pink genes. Um, that's what's being looked at. But there's been this long time uh, notion that Parkinson's disease seems to be just a sporadic disease, and maybe is it an, an infectious disease, and an infectious prion related disease. This is uh, this next article Cardiac sympathetic denervation predicts Parkinson's disease in at risk individuals. So basically, they saw these changes in cardiac function years before the onset of Parkinson's. Now, I couldn't attach this article, but if you want to look it up on PubMed, brain or body first. And here they looked at this feature of Parkinson's disease called RBD, which is basically REM, rapid eye movement behavioral disorder. It's referring to a sleep disorder seen with Parkinson's disease. And they, in essence, showed that those who have RBD, this characteristic sleep disorder of Parkinson's, if you have RBD, the alpha synucleinopathy basically probably started in the gut. If you don't have RBD, the alpha synucleinopathy probably started in the brain and not in the gut. So that is further really cool information. So what does this all mean to you if you have Parkinson's? Just know that there's a tremendous amount of research going on right now trying to find the root cause of Parkinson's. The mainstay therapies remain the same with levodopa, carbidopa, and many new derivations of medications. I think new pro is a new one. Ritari is the extended release form of levodopa, carbidopa, if I remember correctly. So there are all these new medications that are coming about trying to help Parkinson's patients mitigate the effects of tremors. And then we have drug-induced dyskinesias, and we have rigidity issues and bradykinesia issues. If those are not proven to be successful, then Parkinson's disease patients are oftentimes now referred for consideration of deep brain stimulation. And deep brain stimulation has evolved marvelously over the last 25 years. And so it's much more effective, and you can see dramatic changes in people's movement and their tremors with deep brain stimulation, which basically involves putting implanted electrodes into the basal ganglia, which then they can control, the Parkinson's patient can control, um, how that's basically working, and it really gives people a tremendous quality of life. But with that being said, we want to prevent Parkinson's disease in the future, and this new research on how it starts years to decades beforehand in the gut or maybe the olfactory bulb and how it spreads throughout the body. And by the time somebody develops Parkinson's disease, when they've lost like 80% of their dopaminergic producing neurons in the substantia nigra, pars compacta, then they ultimately develop the signs and symptoms of it. So hopefully it helps you understand that Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative process. It started many years ago and maybe we'll have new line therapies targeting alpha synuclein and maybe that will help people to regain some normalcy. If you are interested in natural approaches to Parkinson's, there's a lot of discussion about natural substances that contain L-DOPA and other things that are being done to help uh, the brains of Parkinson's patients naturally. There's a lot of discussion on that. I'm not going to go into that at length tonight um, because some of that it's novel, and because it's not pharmaceutically based, it's a little contentious, but there's a lot of documentation and big journals on it. Lastly, uh, this prion disease component of Parkinson's is not uniformly agreed upon. Not everybody in the literature feels that Parkinson's disease is a prion disease, just so you know, but there is a lot more publications coming about and trying to explain how alpha synuclein is basically spreading between neurons and how is it spreading up the vagus nerve? How is that exactly happening? So that is the key question. So this topic was in a little more detail. I wanted to do it that way just because 
Um, I think most of you have the basic gist of information on Parkinson's, and so this is a little more in-depth discussion on the gut-brain connection between this disorder. So, okay, that is it. I'm going to end the live stream. I hope you all have a wonderful evening, and have a good night.